I welcome you all to this special session and um, would like to first of all introduce myself. My name is Sanjay Mathur. I'm a professor at the University of Cologne and I'm also currently the president of the American Ceramic Society. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all at, uh, on this uh, occasion of a special event, which is special in, in several means. First is that we have this year celebrated the International Year of Glass, which was announced and supported by the UN General Council in May 21. So all year long, we had lots of events global, at a global scale. And um, since the International Year of Glass was spearheaded by the leaders of ACERS, it's a special pleasure to host this event because it is special for several reasons. One is that we are through this event showing that it is possible to collaborate uh, with transatlantic activities. So we are joining hands here with the North California section of the American Ceramic Society, with the American Ceramic Society Germany chapter, and both the volunteers or groups have worked quite a bit in, in the background to prepare this event. And another reason that is special is because uh, this was the, a brainchild of our former uh, president, Dr. Sylvia Johnson, who had met or who had the opportunity to meet our today's special guest, Mr. Joachim Itik, who is um, very good in going around with this special, or I will say, uh, a classy material glass, which is for several reasons. I mean, that we are communicating through this digital platform. Also, we have to thank to glass because without optical fibers, we won't be doing that. But glass has several facets. It's it's a green material, it's recyclable, and it's obviously a delight for artists like Mr. Itik. So I think um, Sylvia has seen his uh, glass art on some occasion, and she then came up with this, that why don't, since it's in their time in Germany, why don't you visit them and see if there's a possibility to host an event on science and art of glass. So with this idea, we have also visited Mr. Itik, and I think he was very kind in, in hosting the group members and they have taken a video which will be displaying. And also they, they had a chance to do glass blowing themselves. So this was like also a, a unique experience for the volunteers of the Acer Germany chapter. Right, and at this point, uh, I think I would like to also um, acknowledge that a lot of people have helped us. I would like to thank uh, Marilyn Stolz who was just uh, here you know, on, online. Um, and, uh, Yolanda, who has been very instrumental in keeping this young group together, and Karen, uh, who, who is our uh, liaison for ACES International Chapters. And obviously, um, the leaders from both the, the North Californian section. So I think um, uh, today, Professor Scott McCormack, he's not here, but uh, he's represented by, by uh, Fox Torpe. And I, yeah, I see him here. He's one of our PCSA delegates and and uh, Dr. Aman Bharadwaj, who is uh, heading the Asia Germany chapter, Mr. Ziad Aituna and Mr. David Patroon. And um, I think uh, we also have uh, our invited speak speaker, Dr. Abilgard. And uh, I think uh, we have a fixed plan, although we have lost five minutes, but I don't want to take any further uh, time of this, this, I would say, star studded session. And then we'll hand over the, the floor to Dr. Aman Bharadwaj. And once again, a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Aman, floor thank is yours. Thank you, Professor Mathur. And thank you very much for joining us in the event. We are celebrating in the North Carolina chapter for making this event happen. And thank you very much also to uh, Professor Sylvia Johnson and especially Professor Scott McMahon who really helped to make this event happen today. And we have Fox Sorpel who is taking care from uh, the Northern California chapter. So I would like to briefly share uh, my one of the slides so that I can uh, discuss a little bit about our North uh, Germany chapter of the American Ceramic Society and give you a brief uh, a brief uh, explanation about how it all happened and what we are doing for last few years, especially the few events which occurred in this year in the recognition of the International Year of Glass. 
And uh, let me share my slide. I hope my slides are visible now. Okay. So as we all know that uh, this uh, 2022 is recognized as the German as the uh, uh, International Glass Year of, by the United Nations and the American Ceramic Society has taken this opportunity to celebrate it very often over the whole year. And uh, we as America's ASAS Germany chapter had the opportunity to organize a few events over the year, especially because we are celebrating the International Year of Glass. Going back to the ASAS Germany chapter, it started in nearly 2017 when Professor Master and other colleagues of the research group started this chapter in here. And presently, we are having five uh, chapter officers. I am holding the chair position of the American Ceramic Society German chapter with Anna Varma as vice chair. We are having Via Daituna, who is a secretary, Ida Rao, who is a officer, and Ruth Adams, who is our youngest member and also the treasurer position. And uh, all, because of the support of all of the different chapter officers, we are able to manage to make this event occur. And we have a few officer elect this year. For example, David Patron, Andrea Fristenberg, Kruti Halanka, Benedict Vitulski, and Jonathan Lee, who will be taking over a few of the positions by the next year. Over the years, it was really nice to organize some events after the whole sort of opening after the corona. And therefore, we were able to organize a wine tour in 2022 in Ahata, Germany. When uh, Mark McLenbar, the executive director of the ASAP, also joined us on 9th of July. We had a nice wine tour and also tasted a few wines and had a dinner lunch together. Moving further, we also were able to organize a summer school in Krakow, Poland, where we, uh, where we spent almost a week in the AGS University and uh, we celebrated and also recognize the United Nations Development Goals. Also, we were able to organize a few workshops on communication as well as networking events. We were also able to discuss the American Ceramic Society's vision about glass and ceramic, um, especially in research and science, and also its, uh, uh, its ability to how it can deliver the science sustainability towards the development and scientific knowledge. We were also able to organize especially a glass symposium in the recognition of the International Year of Glass in Mainz, Germany, where we also collaborated with the Glass Society of Germany in, in the support of short AG company. And we were able to have a workshop on how the glass is made and how its commercial uh, value is keep on increasing because of its functional properties. We were able to develop, a, 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 we were able to have a few workshops, for example, trilateral Indian German Korean workshop on 24th June in Kolor, where a few colleagues from India, for example, Professor Ravi Kumar and Professor Kwan Ho Kim from India and South Korea came together and we were able to see how ceramic is helping and delivering a really amazing facilities and functional properties to a few of uh, uh, applications needed in the present time. Also, there were another workshop we organized with the Cairo University, German University in Cairo. And this collaboration also helps us understand the science or uh, art of ceramics and glass into bio nano research field and how it can help our uh, uh, use, users of glass and ceramics in especially medicines and medicine delivery. With this, we are planning a few of uh, different uh, workshops and events in 2023, where we are planning Solon summer school in, in the support of University of Solon, which will be occurring next year, probably in France. 
and also we are planning fourth international Rhine Roundtable meeting, which will be occurring in cooperation with the glass and ceramic societies such as ASER, ESER, DKG, and DEG. And this is planned in, to occur in the University of Cologne in 2023. And with this, I would like to further provide the floor to Fox Horpe, who will be discussing more about the chapter activities in Northern California. And he will give you more briefly about how this cooperation all occurred. And with this, I give the floor to you, Fox. Yes, and I won't take too long. I just want to introduce the ACERS Northern California section and get us over to our glass experts. But thank you guys both so much. Um, and I'm really excited that we were able to manage this international collaboration. So the ACERS Northern California section um, started up, we we broke from, from the full California section, I believe in 2019, 2020, that time frame. Um, and we've been setting up some events, uh, this one at the end of the year, and then two coming early in 2023. So I'll just go ahead and jump and introduce our members. Um, this is from last year's data when we split with NorCal, Southern California. And so they found a parallel and drove our split there. Um, Scott McCormick is the um, chair of the ASIA's NorCal section. I am the representative of the PCSA. And then we have Randy Swanson, who's a grad student representative. And then Trevor Lee, who represents the undergrads. Um, Ellie Sobovaro works with Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, Dave Chaffee and Laura Roberts, you can see here, San Jose State and Shot, as well as uh, Sylvia Johnson um, and, and Jim Shackelford. So that's uh, the Asia's NorCal section. And with that, I think we're ready to jump into our speakers. So thank you very much. So I think with this, uh, Mark can share his slides and we can all look over how his work is benefiting the glass and ceramics. Okay, I'm waiting for Marilyn to put them up. Yikes. Bear with me for just a second. Technical difficulties. Okay, no problem. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. Yes. Marvelous. Okay, was Fox going to make a little intro or should I just go ahead? Right, sorry. So our first speaker is, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, our first speaker is Mark Applegard. Um, Mark earned his bachelor's degree from the University of, San uh, University of San Francisco State and a master's of fine arts from the University of Hawaii. He's been exhibiting art across the United States for over 30 years. Mark specializes in kiln glass sculpture, which he uses to convey history, emotion, and ideas about the cycle of life and death. He is an enthusiastic and experienced teacher and has taught classes and workshops in glass at many different schools and studios, including the famous Pilchuck School, the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass, and Red Deer College in Alberta, Canada. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much, and please give us your presentation. All right, Fox, thank you so much. Um, let me just jump in here with, uh, with the initial slide. I have um, two pieces up on the screen and the one that's a little uh, slide uh, is currently in an exhibition at the Wayne Art Center in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And the one on the right is in another gallery. The little shrine piece on the left was made with a lost wax casting process. And the one on the right was made with uh, just using clay to model the figures. And I wanted to go through a little bit and explain uh, the processes involved because it sort of ties together both ceramics and glass uh, in the sense of using, using both materials to create a sculpture. 
So if we could go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to put this in uh, for a couple of reasons. This is taken at San Francisco State University back in the mid seventies where I was an undergraduate student. And that was actually one of my instructors and one of my co-workers. I worked as a lab assistant in the ceramics department. And for some reason they're doing a performance of dipping my assistant Rachel into a bucket that was full of clay collected from potter's wheels. After you throw a pot on the potter's wheel, you have all this, you know, soft clay. And um, so I was studying wheel throwing ceramics. I was studying how to fire a kiln and calculate glazes and all of this. But the main reason I wanted to put this in here is to talk about the complete um, difference between glass and clay in terms of being able to touch the material. I mean, clay, you can immerse yourself in it. You know, it, you, you can touch it and leave your fingerprint on it. You, you know, it's totally accessible. Glass, on the other hand, you, you have to find some way to approach it sculpturally, whether it's with tools, carving, cutting, you know, hot glass, obviously metal tools for working, shaping, and for casting all the mold making processes. So glass has this inherent difficulty associated with how do you bring your um, imagery into the material where clay, you can just grab a hold of it. Um, next image, please. So I, st I started out as a ceramic uh, student, you know, doing wheel throwing pottery and learning all the kiln firing processes involved in that. And I graduated into doing hot glass. And so this is hot casting you're, where you're actually scooping ladles of glass out of a furnace and pouring it into a mold. And this was at the University of Hawaii. Now it's in the mid eighties. And I was there as a graduate student and we were getting our glass from local shops that were doing window glass and we were recycling the window glass. So we had like unlimited quantities of glass to experiment with. Um, we would melt the window glass with, uh, with, with the addition of some fluxes to make it, to make it uh, workable. Um, but you could heat the glass in the furnace and then you could pour it into mold. So I did quite a bit of casting when I was, when I was in grad school um, and still trying to figure out what I could do with it. Uh, next image, please. So these are the earliest pieces that I you know, have pictures of um, that were sand cast uh, partially and blown. The vessel portion was obviously blown with a blow pipe, but the, the cast part on, on these pieces was done um, by pressing images into sand damp sand, just like you would make uh, you know, a footprint on, the, on walking on the beach and then pouring the hot glass into that sand impression and making bars or shapes uh, with the sand casting. And so this was really instrumental in my work in that I looked at the blown part and I looked at the cast part and I decided I would work towards doing cast glass. Uh, next image, please. I was fortunate enough in 1985 to receive a fellowship at this Creative Glass Center of America, which is in Millville, New Jersey. And I cast these early pieces um, in a sand mold, you know, just by the same uh, hot glass casting with a ladle and used powdered glass for the colors. And I was able to really introduce images that I made for the first time by making these uh, faces out of clay, I actually out of wheel thrown pottery shapes that I would form into these faces and then bisque fire them and then press those into the sand. So I was using clay as a means to get the glass to have some imagery that I wanted to put into it. And then all of the colors and things were, um, you know, just left over from the hot glass work that I'd been doing with, with, with blowing. So I was able to put those together to make these sand castings. Uh, next image, please. So this was one of the last castings I did during this five month residency in Millville, New Jersey. And um, you know, early on I had, uh, this piece was acquired by the Corning Museum in Corning, New York. So it's part of their collection. 
So I was very excited to have my work, you know, initially recognized by a museum. Um, and then I had to go and set up my own studio. And that became the next uh, struggle in that I couldn't see my way to recreating a hot glass studio, you know, in order to melt enough glass to be able to pour hot glass into these molds. So that's when I turned into developing my own approach to kiln cast glass. Uh, next image, please. So basically what, what worked for me was I found out that I was um, able to sculpt directly in clay. So this is a clay sculpture, solid clay, and then go through a mold making process to turn this into glass. And for me, that was a big breakthrough because I was able to use all of my background and experience in shaping and texturing clay, and then go through the steps of mold making to turn this into glass. So this would be a finished piece in clay. And next image. Then I would just make a simple mold. And that just means making a metal surround and pouring in a mixture of plaster and silica. And the plaster is the binder and the silica is the refractory component that lets the mold survive the temperature in the kiln. And um, that would create a simple mold that I could use to cast glass in. Uh, next image, please. So the molds were just simple open face molds where the surface of the clay was exposed and I could just remove it, physically remove it with a spoon or a, you know, some kind of tool. And then you wind up with a hollow shape of what exactly what the clay was. And now you can put glass into it and fire it in an electric kiln. Uh, next image. So the kiln basically uh, is loaded with the molds already filled with glass. So it's not a matter of pouring hot glass, it's a matter of heating glass already in the molds. You can stack the glass up and it'll melt down and fill the mold and make a solid glass casting. Uh, next image. So this is the end of the firing where it's uh, reached its melting point of around 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. And now the kiln is gonna be controlled on an annealing cycle to cool the glass slowly so that it won't have any stress in it. And basically this is the process I use for about 20 years to make glass sculpture. Next image. So there's the finished piece that has all the textures and shapes from the clay now transformed into glass. And so this was really a breakthrough for me to be able to turn what had been sculpted in clay into glass. Next image. So this is what I've been working on up until, you know, even this year, I've made pieces using this technique. So these are all solid clay sculpted pieces. They're made in sections so they can be taken apart. And then this will be cast in glass. Uh, what really is helpful is that the clay has similar weight to what the glass would be. And so when I'm putting these together, this is just freestanding. When it's put together in glass, it'll be epoxy together to make it permanent. Uh, but by working in clay, I can get the balance and the spacing and the shapes all finished uh, in clay. Uh, next image. So there's the finished sculpture. Um, this is on display at the John Natsoulis Gallery in Davis, California. It's a local gallery where I show my work. Um, and the colors of the glass come from uh, the company that I'm purchasing the glass from, Bullseye Glass in Portland, Oregon, will make a variety of colored glasses that I can order and use in different combinations. Uh, next image, please. So what changed for me was I was able to work as an instructor at the Pilchuck Glass School in Stanwood, Washington, uh, you know, in the northern part of the West Coast, Washington State. This school was founded by Dale Chihuly, primarily as a resource for people to learn how to work with hot glass. And then as time went by, they added a studio for doing uh, neon and for kiln casting glass and stained glass. So I worked up on the hill looking down at the hot shop uh, and I taught a three week course in kiln casting glass. Uh, next image. So this was one of my students um, at, in, at Pilchuck. 
And he introduced me to the idea of using clay as a mold for wax. So all of these little brown shapes are solid wax forms that he created by pressing images into wet clay. And there's a wet clay mold there on the side of those other pieces that has wax in it. And you just peel the clay off and you have a wax form. And I was so impressed. I had never seen anyone do this that it really stuck in my mind. Uh, next image. So these were his little castings that we made um, from the waxes. And I thought it was just a, a real interesting process because again, going back to clay and using the clay as a form to get the wax shapes. Um, next image. So I decided in a few years after being at Pilchuck and thinking about this, you know, it sort of was haunting me that instead of using, these are ceramic shapes here that I had been using to press into sand to make sand uh, castings. What if I took these shapes and pressed them into clay and made a mold for a wax and used a similar process as to sand cast, casting glass, except now I'd be making this for a large wax. So next image. So I set up you know, a few attempts and then decided to make a very large uh, sculpture where I laid out a, a, a large quantity of clay and then made a shape to press these images. So you can see this is wet clay with all of these images pressed into it. And now I'm gonna pour this as a solid wax. Uh, next slide. And that's just the detail of it. Next slide. So it's poured with a wax um, that will take up all of the shapes and textures that were pressed into the clay. Uh, next slide. So the clay is just peeled away. It is a one-time mold, could only be used for this one piece. And then uh, next slide. Then I would have this wax that now I could make a mold from for the glass. Next slide. So this is the mold getting prepared for the plaster silica coating on the left, and that's the coating on the right. Next slide. So the mold became heavy enough. I needed to lift it up with a hoist, and I had put an extra fiberglass layer on the outside with the plaster silica to support it. Next slide. Then I had to melt the wax out of the mold, which was done in a big trough that was meant for uh, watering livestock, actually. But as a, as a glass artist, you have to adapt and you have to do a lot of creative problem solving, which is similar in the sciences, is that you have to learn how to solve your problems for each project as they come up. So this is the piece, this is the mold that the wax has melted out of. Next slide. And that's the clean mold. Now I did uh, a larger uh, mold than I had facility to put into a kiln. So I made arrangements to work with a factory in Portland, Oregon that would, that would accommodate this mold. Next slide, please. So this is me <clears throat> uh, at the Yoroboros Glass Factory in Portland, Oregon, where I drove the molds that I had created and for this project and did a single firing with everything in one large kiln load. It took 18 days to complete this firing because of the size of the pieces. Um, took three days to melt the glass, but the rest of the time was spent cooling it down slowly because the glass has to be annealed or it'll have stress in it and could crack. Next slide, please. So this is the one of the finished pieces I came out of this project that I titled Yoroboros Totem uh, as a nod to the glass factory where it was made but also because of the circular element at the top, which was like the, tail, the snake eating its tail, the Yoroboros symbol. And so this was over six feet tall, um, one of the larger castings that I was able to make. Uh, next image, please. Uh, fortunately, this piece was acquired by the Crocker Museum in um, Northern California here in Sacramento. And now I've been able to go there and take field trips of uh, elementary school students and explain the process and talk about my work in person, uh, which has been, a, which has been a, a, a real honor. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to wrap up, I'm combining both techniques of making images with wax and clay in sections and then putting them together 
depending on what the imagery is. Um, sometimes it's more appropriate to use the wax because it can be a lot more uh, intricate than the clay. Um, and then other times the clay is perfectly suited for this. So clay has really become a translator for me to get my imagery into glass. And that's, uh, that's, that's been the, the, the one thing I've learned over the years is that to, in order for me to work with glass, I have to use clay as a way to put the imagery into it. And uh, next slide, and this will be my, whoops, final slide. Okay. All right, thank you so much. So then let's thank Mark Ebersberg for this beautiful work that he showed us. And uh, let's go over to uh, our second glass artist, which is Hans Joachim Ittig. Um, I don't really don't want it to say too much because most is presented in the video. We, we had opportunity to meet Hans Joachim and uh, we could see how passionate he's working and how much fun he's having in his art. But uh, I would uh, just let you enjoy the video because everything is said in that video and uh, just enjoy it. So give me a second to share it with you. So I hope that everybody can see it. Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. I'm Ziad Aitona. And I'm David Patron. And we are current PhDs in the working group of Professor Matur in Cologne. And we are representatives of ASAS and MRS. And we are on our way to their time. Yes. There we're going to show you a typical glass and ceramic city, or let's say a historical glass and ceramic city of Germany. And we're going to visit a manufacturer, as and well as we're going to show you the old town and the castle of Bertram. And we will go a little into the detail how the glass is produced. So see you there. Our audience is spread over the west coast of America and the center of Europe. But where are we taking you? That time is the northernmost city in Baden-Württemberg, on the border with Bavaria. It is located about 70 kilometers from Frankfurt and about 30 kilometers from Würzburg. With its 24,000 inhabitants, it is a very cozy community. Wertheim is a former castle settlement of the late 12th century with characteristic urban extensions of the 15th to 19th centuries. But please take a look for yourselves. So finally after this long march we arrived at this huge castle here in Wertheim. What is our next stop? The next stop will be Achim, the glass workshop, and uh, let's go to the workshop. Let's go. So, uh, we are now here together. The Wertheimer Glaskunst, American Ceramic Society, and we are very happy that we could uh, have a look into your work and that we had the possibility to meet you and look the, at the preparation methods. Um, Thanks for being here. First, let's talk about a few facts. Hans Joachim Ittig, called Achim, is a passionate glass artist since 1984. He leads the seventh generation of his family business side by side with his right hand Kazimir alias Kazi. But now, please enjoy the show. The beginning of the whole piece. So we're gonna drop the color on a clear bubble. And I'm going to blow inside here. This, this is classic studio glass. Mm -hmm. Of course, all the colors and the mother glass is compatible. We're working in a coefficient of expansion uh, 96. This became very common in the modern studio glass. All the tools are very traditional. 
They even have Italian names. This is so-called color drop, a little chunk of cobalt blue will be dropped on top. You already started the shaping now of the... Of the... No, I just encased the clear completely in blue, so I pulled it over. Okay. It's called an overlay. So okay. I overlay the clear bubble with a thin layer of cobalt blue. Okay. Which is also known as the royal blue. It's... Uh, I think the cobalt blue should every chemist know already. Yes, <laughs> and I believe... As Achim has already explained, he now performs a so-called overlaying process by rolling different colored glass melts layer by layer one on another. bubble he uses his special tools and wet newspaper. His tools also help him remove impurities from the molten glass. Following, Kazi and Achim perform a special twisting technique to add decoration to the finished object. It's the glass and optical irritation. So we're going to use and make some ribbons now and the, the change of the wall thickness will cause an optical effect. That's why this little mold, stampa, stampa, is called an optic mold. So now I have these ribbons here. And you can hear the ribbons. Again, very Italian.
Menachem using the centrifugal forces to open up the vase. To give the vase its final shape, a form-giving object is used. Now we are reaching the moment of truth. One wrong stroke destroys the ambitious work of Achim. For post tempering, the final vase must be placed in the oven for 24 hours. Meanwhile, we will show you a second, very elaborate technique. The following method, known as Crecule, is a technique with origin in France. Powders or granules are applied to the glass bubble during this procedure. The bubble is then quenched in water to create cracks on purpose. The vase has lava-like optics due to the combination of a red interior color and dark and light elements in the outside layers. For the end, let's do some Q&A. Which temperatures does the oven reach? So we, we do centigrade here in Europe and uh, it's 1150 degrees centigrade and uh, the, the, the melter, the furnace, is uh, continuously hot. Those, part, those, uh, those colors exist in the shape of a stick, in the shape of a glass rod, in the shape of a glass spaghetti, like a stringer, we call it. And uh, we can buy it as a grain and as a powder. I don't like to work with powders because of the silicosis. It's kind of dusty, you need a color box and an exhaust, and so I use a lot of color bars. What, what are the most popular colors besides this blue that you mentioned already? 
the gold ambers are very beautiful and uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of pink. Okay. And purple <laughs> and lavenders and, and those are the most expensive colors in my industry mm -hmm. because of the amount of gold again. Yeah, sure. out the Wertheimer Glaskunst. We enjoyed the day very, very much and uh, we are very happy that we could visit you, that we, we could see how you prepare all, all, those, uh, all this art. And uh, for this, uh, we wanted to say also thank you in the name of the University of Cologne, in the name of the uh, California chapter of the ASOS American Ceramic Society and the German chapter, thank you so much. which are uh, we, and therefore we have a small gift for you which uh, is, uh, you can also it. join us, of course. Gazi, <laughs> look at that. Uh, it's a certificate of appreciation from the ASOS community. Um, the typical shirt, which we wear, you can also get one of them. I we have love bring it. two because we thought that there will be more than one person. Thank you and so like much, guys. And like every guest and uh, participant of our ASOS and MRS chapters get is the Kölsch for collaboration. I it's, appreciate it's it so much, a Kölsch glass for that exactly. fine little Kölsch they beer. Have our logos and our, <laughs> our contacts. Thank you so much. We this goes in my collect and a t-shirt for Hansi. I'm going to need exactly. it now so after work. Casimir, so come Kasimir, here. You, you join, join us. us maybe for a second. <laughs> Hope you have an extra large shirt for Kasi. Perfect. Super. Thank you, we, guys. We so hello everybody again, we are at our trip at home, it was a beautiful day and it was a beautiful city where time is really nice to visit and I can just uh, recommend it to everybody, to every ceramics fan, to every glass fan and uh, David, do you have last words? Yeah, I would say thank you once again to Achim who showed us uh, how beautiful glass can be, who showed us how much uh, passion he has in his job and how much fun you need for for uh, for doing a job good <laughs> and yeah thanks thank to you. asos thanks to Achim, and thanks for this cooperation thank you very much see you guys Excellent. Well, it seems we have maybe just five minutes for question and answers at the end, but I just want to say thank you so much, Ahim and uh, Mark. Um, so if audience, you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll go through and answer them. Um, I have a few, but we'll start with one in the chat. Uh, it says, question for Mark. Um, can you say a bit more about the interesting symbolism used in your sculptures? And I'll expand this to both of you. What inspires your art pieces and what's kind of your, your muse as you're making your art? Oh, thank you. Um, so what what struck me when I went to the University of Hawaii was the Polynesian art that I hadn't really been exposed to. So a lot of wood carvings uh, in Polynesian art in their simplicity, um, and they had a lot of boat imagery and this metaphor as a boat, as a transition between life and death kind of on a journey. And I really, really was drawn to that imagery and tried to make it my own. Very cool. Um, did you have a, uh, what, what inspires your art? What, what pieces do you, what makes you decide to make what pieces? Well, that's, uh, yeah, what I can sell, you know, I have to live on it. <laughs> so the sales really direct uh, uh, my work, but uh, what inspired me always and what I do on the side, what I really don't really sell is Morini work, which is, which is very work intense. And I spend hours on a tiny little piece and a, a regular person over here wouldn't really appreciate what, 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 how many work is involved here. And 
um, it was Pilchuck and Mark, you know, uh, Mark knows now what I'm talking about. That changed my life. So I went a couple times there and I really admire Mark's work all these years. I love your work, Mark. Oh, it's you. super cool, the kiln casting. I, I, I do it also in combination with blowing. As a matter of fact, right now we're trying to make that diatrate glass, you know, that double yeah, wall yeah, glass. Right, yeah. In, I blow cups and I stuff them in a mold and I, I let it fuse together in a cup. And I believe and I think this we do some research and studies on it right now. This is the way it was done, you know, that they blew yeah. two cups and they were casting them in plaster and those little bridges got together with a hole in, in the inside mold with a mold in between and 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 so this is an endless thing and uh, that glass thing you know and uh, when I was TAing for Dick Marcus and I was a student from him one year and went a couple times to Pilchuck and my dad taught there then uh, this changed my life you know and I, I like that American studio glass inspired me the most you know and certain things that they made were very similar that my great grandfather already did. I'm the seventh generation in my family and I have some old work and, and this wow. is stuff from the 50s and it's really modern too. <laughs> so this is a cool thing. Glass is just super cool and um, you need the ceramics with it, you know. Great example, Ceram. You know, shot is just around the corner here. I live in a very, very industrial environment here. I'm the only studio glass artist in my town and 20,000 others work very industrial and scientific. And uh, so you, it's an endless thing, but what really, what really like to make is the Marini work, chopping canes and stuff like this. So we're kind of running out of time, but I'd like to ask one last question. Um, you're both primarily artists, as I understand it, and I'd say you're speaking mostly to scientists. Um, could you maybe talk about the marriage of art and science when it comes to glass, and how, how does your understanding work with those? Mark, well, if you want I'll to go be, first. Yeah. I'll just jump in real quick. I mean, you know, because of the challenges of glass technically to work with it, to anneal it properly, and you're dealing with formulas for the molds and you're dealing with, you know, the temperature uh, programs for the kiln. And, you know, it's a process of experimentation and finding a result that works that you can repeat. And so it's, you know, it's applying a scientific method to create an artwork. Whereas, you know, if I was a painter and I could go splash paint on the canvas, I wouldn't be as technically involved in that, you know, and, and the glass is just so demanding. You know, if you don't do the steps correctly in, in almost every part of the process, it will not come out. So I think there's a connection there just in, in handling a material that requires that kind of technical, uh, that kind of technical discipline. I completely agree here. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> true. <laughs> and the theory, you know, and all those uh, theoretical things sometimes do not really work in the practice, like when you do it, you know. I had this one guy at my place and we took a four inch block, four inch, like 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter. And I asked him, how long would you heat it up? So he grabbed that formula thing and he said <laughs> like two days, you know, I told him I do it in two hours. Yeah, and it works. And, uh, well, though this is the thing. Uh, really ex inspiring for me was an invitation to Alfred University when Stephen D. Edward was still teaching in Alfred. And this is a, a very cool ceramic department. And they had a little, a little uh, studio glass section there. And Aileen Christofferson, an old buddy from Pilchuck, and Ruth King went down there and blew glass with me. And what I saw then is that there was already combinations between glass and ceramics at Alfred. And uh, they just went wild, <laughs> like over the borders. <laughs> and then when the liquid Lumina came and it enabled us to make the alphabet in the Marini differently, and they even used styroform as an instead of wax and, and the wild things, you know. 
and and just that liquid lumina over it and different than I'm used to have it here. Well, it is um, reaching the end of our time. I'm happy to stay and chat if we want to leave the panel open. I don't know if we can do that, but I do want to say again, thank you so much to everyone that helped organize. Thank you again, Mark and uh, Yoshan. That was amazing. Um, and thank you everyone for coming and being able to attend. Yeah, before we conclude, let me just thank you, Fox, for, for leading uh, from the US side and David and Ziad for putting this huge effort and obviously to our excellent speakers. It was so fascinating and motivating to see that how, uh, I mean, science and art, you both have shown that you have to have a very deeper understanding, but at the same time, also to see that ceramics and um, refractory also play a, a big role in shaping glass and it, on your side, when you were talking about um, the coloration, I think um, there is a lot which we can do there. I mean, you have your favorite colors, but I'm sure that through all the dopants that you can have, and, and one of the points that you have raised that you don't like to work with glass powders, which I can understand, because despite being glass used as bioactive, there is still not much known uh, on the metabolization of glass. So it's, it's also leaving some open questions for, for science to follow up because glass is now increasingly being used for uh, in bioceramics. So uh, yeah, I, I thank you both for your time. I would have loved to see more question and answer, I'm sure, but I'm sure this is the first of its kind. We never hosted such an event. And I must say, I didn't realize how this hour is gone. So thank you very much to both of you. Thanks, Mark, for, for sharing this amazing thank work you. that you have done. Thanks, Hans. And thank you. Yeah, thanks to all the speakers. And once again, we look forward to the second episode of this. This is recorded, and I'm sure that I've got too many emails saying people who could not join. So this will be available. Obviously, if you would like to distribute it somewhere, but we will be doing this definitely. So with this, uh, we thank you also on behalf of the American Ceramic Society for sharing your time and your art. Thank you so much. Right. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. We need to get ready for the soccer game, Fox. Yes, <laughs> and, and I do have this piece, this lovely piece as that came yes. from your uh, your <laughs> You're studio. welcome. Thank you. Sanjay, Thank you we're so going to meet. <laughs> Thank yeah, you sure, so definitely. much. We're going to meet. Thank <laughs> you. When I'm in Cologne, I hook you up. <laughs> please, please, please do come over. Thank you so much for having Thank me you. here. Thank Thanks. you.